Hi there. Uh, my name is Tamala Olsby, and I am from the Texas Education Agency. And I just wanted to welcome you here this afternoon um, to this webinar. And we're going to cover three learning centers, so that should be pretty interesting. Um, notice that there are a couple of handouts in the handout section. So if that is of interest to you, you can go ahead and download those. And uh, with no further ado, I think we're going to get started. So I, um, again, my name is Tamala Olsby, and I have Cassie Lingoria here assisting me today. So if you have any difficulties or want to talk to one of us, just type it into the questions box. And if we don't get to it during the webinar, we'll get to it right afterwards. So our topic today is on blocks, the library listening area, and on the math area. So our agenda today, we're going to very briefly uh, review what we did in Unit 1. And then we are going to spend most of our time on learning centers. And the very first part, we're going to define what a learning center is, try to explain why do you do learning centers in the younger grades, and we'll talk about the similarities between all of the centers, and then we will dive deep into the blocks, the library, and the math area. We'll do a little practice, and then uh, we'll talk about um, your work that you're going to do, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, our PLC topic, and our upcoming phone calls. So that'll tell you what we're going to do in the next hour. So in a review of Unit 1, uh, we talked about some general guidance um, on a high-quality pre-kindergarten classroom. We talked about, is it aesthetically pleasing? Um, are there areas in the room for large group, small group, and individual instruction? Um, does the room look healthy and safe? Um, do the furnishings, the furniture, the shelving units, all of that match the age of the children in the classroom? Does it look like a classroom that three and four year olds should be in? And then are there learning centers in the room? We also talked about that a classroom not only should have all of those things that we just mentioned, but a classroom should also be a place. Remember, we talked about the emotional connection that some environments have for us. And um, when you have that connection emotionally to an environment, cognition is greater. And so we talked about what are the kids in your room see when they come into the classroom? What do they hear and smell? What do they, they can't wait to touch something. Um, what helps your students feel like that is their classroom? And most importantly, what makes the student not want to leave? So that kind of tells you a little bit about what we did in Unit 1. So we're going to move along and talk about learning centers. And um, here is a definition that I would like us to use. It says learning centers are well-defined interest areas that provide children with a wide range of materials and opportunities to engage in hands-on learning across the curriculum. So from this definition, I think there's a couple of key um, uh, items to, to be drawn to. One is that they're very well-defined. Um, so, you know when you are in the block area and when you are out of the block area. So, um, there's a definite boundary there. Um, it also, in this definition, says that children use them. So, they aren't for teachers necessarily, they're for children. There's a wide range of materials within them. They are used for hands-on learning. And there is a tie to whatever the curriculum is in the classroom. So why do 
younger grade levels, especially pre-kindergarten, why do they use this style of teaching? I want us to watch this short video. It's only a couple of minutes, but it's going to talk about how a brain is developed. And I think from this video, we can take some um, concepts and apply it to the environment. So let's go ahead and see if we can get this going. Okay, sorry about that. Something happened. We're going to try again. Okay, I heard the sound is low, so I'm going to try to um, get that up too. Let's try again. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. During this important Oops. period of... Sorry about that. So from that, we um, can tell that when a child is growing up, they basically have two... Um, ways that they learn. One is part of their genetic makeup. The other is the experiences that they have. And the brain develops mainly because of the experience connecting to another experience. So connections are very important. It's also important that the child has repeated experiences. That's why little kids always want you to read the book like 17 times. <laughs> um, it also is important that their experience go from very simple to more complex. Otherwise, there will not be a connection. And then the last thing is that all of those experiences are connected in some way. And that, that tells us, these four things, tells us a good framework for what good early childhood looks like, which also affects the environment. So young children learn by making connections. That means during the day, they should have many different experiences that are all connected in some way. That's why usually with young children, there is a theme or a unit or a project and everything that's done during the day, the book they read, the art project they do, the songs they sing, whatever is connected to whatever that 
overarching theme is. That is really good brain development because it's making connections. Again, the child should also have repeated use. And that's why they, um, if the knowledge and skills are integrated from one activity to another, that helps in their brain development. And it also builds upon other experiences that they have had previously. The simple to complex is important to think of in the environment. And we're going to talk about this when we get into the learning centers. That's why you want uh, diversity and how hard the items are in the learning center to do. Because each child is going to progress at their own rate. One child simple is where they are, where another child might be at the complex stage. And there needs to be something for each of those students in each of the learning centers. This also helps the student to prepare for later experiences, like more formal reading. And all of the areas, again, are interconnected. Um, working on their small motor skills, their large motor skills, their visual acuity, their vocabulary and language, how much they can memorize, their emotional well-being, even how they control their behavior is all interconnected and one influences the other. In addition to all of that, young children learn best when they're moving um, and when they're interacting, either with an adult or with a peer. And I would add that one of the best reasons to use learning centers is because it has a direct correlation to minimizing challenging behaviors in the room. And we're going to talk about that in another couple of months. So similar, the learning center should all have some similar characteristics. They should all be um, organized and the students should be able to get the materials easily. They should be um, varied in the difficulty of the materials that are in there and how hard they are to use. Um, the materials in the center should be adequate for the number of um, students that are using that center. They should be on a rotation so that the learning centers are changing fairly often, and that will help keep the students' interest. They should be tied to the current theme or unit or project, and they should reflect the student's culture, background, and the materials in the learning center should be labeled in some way. It's also important that similar areas in the classroom are put together. And we're going to find that. We'll talk about that more when we go over the library area. And then one of the most important things is that it is important to have some print and some opportunities to write in every single center. So I wanted to kind of do a little uh, offshoot on labeling because labeling will affect all of the learning centers. And I couldn't figure out where to put this, so we're doing it today. But the goal with labeling is that the children easily know where things go. That's really the bottom line. And the label should have a picture of the item. Because remember, these little kiddos can't read yet. It should have the English word for the item and any other words that might match the language of the students. So if you have some Spanish speaking students in class, you might put a picture with the English word and the Spanish word. And I have an example here to show you. These are color cubes. So you can see the teacher had a she probably cut out from a magazine or downloaded this cute picture of the color cubes. And then it's very nicely printed, both the English and Spanish um, words there. 
So we're going to dive a little deeper now into each of the three areas that we're going to go over. So the first area that we're going to go over is blocks. And quite frankly, this is probably one of the most popular centers in a pre-kindergarten classroom. So what do kids learn in the block area? They help the student represent an image, a road, a building, something. Um, they also help them practice math and science concepts like size, shape, height, balance, patterns, all of that. They're always talking in the block area, so they get lots of practice with social, social skills. They enhance their problem-solving abilities. They have to figure out why their building keeps falling down. They gain vocabulary. When the block center is done really well, vocabulary will be learned in the block center. And it helps develop good work habits, like planning. What blocks do I need to make a farm? And then how would I go about doing that? So some ideas for what you would put in a block area would be unit blocks. Um, and there's a lot of them, large, small, foam, hollow, cardboard. There's a million kinds of unit blocks and they're very popular. They are also very expensive. So in a little bit, we're going to talk about what do you do when you don't have any money? <laughs> there are also other kinds of building toys that are not considered unit blocks. And those are things that interlock, like say a bristle block. Um, uh, that would be a good example of one. The other things, Tinker Toys, Legos, all of those. So anything that a child usually makes something with to represent something um, could go in the block area. And then there's a lot of other stuff that can go in the block area to enhance the play. Um, vehicles, little play figures, animals, signs, buildings, fences, they, they, there's a million things. If you want to spend money, you can spend a lot of it in the block area. So what happens when you don't have any money? So you don't have money to buy the $500 uh, unit block set from a manufacturer. Um, I remember one of my very first jobs I would go to some construction sites. I would ask them for their lumber. I made a friend at Home Depot and asked, uh, you know, do you have any extra da da da? The friend at Home Depot ended up cutting them and sanding them for me. So you might think about that. <laughs> um, but basically, I made my own blocks. Um, I remember making blocks out of milk cartons when I really had no money. Um, so there are ways to collect these items without spending um, money on the big ticket items. Um, garage sales also, you know, people have little children and they need blocks at one time in their life and then they're old and they don't want to play with them anymore. So garage sales are also a good um, uh, way to get um, items for the block area. When you're thinking about how do you make the block area have a, a, a different degrees of difficulty, I would think of the size of the blocks, especially. So to, a good example of that would be Legos. Legos are pretty small. Um, so in a three-year-old class, you might want to use Duplos rather than Legos. And then in the four-year-old class, use the Legos. And the difficulty will be in the small motor um, and how well the child can put things together. Um, and then alignment with uh, the theme or the unit or the project. How could you change the block area to fit different um, themes that you are doing? So let's say um, at the beginning of the year, you're doing a unit on my family. 
you might actually take pictures of family members. You could take pictures of the kids in your classroom and uh, tape them to the blocks. You could use those little, oh, what are they, clips, and you clip the picture of the person, and that becomes um, the family. You can do that with pictures of animals. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can take whatever the theme is and try to build it in to the block area. So when they're learning about it, say at the large group time, then they're more likely to play it when they get in the block area. We could spend a lot of time on how to align things. And print and writing opportunities. Here are some great ideas on what you could add in the block area. Maps um, or graph paper, blueprints. If you know any architects, those are awesome. Floor plans, go to your local um, you know, model home <laughs> and take some of their floor plans. Um, and books, you could always put books in there of farmhouses, um, uh, community books, um, books about construction workers, anything like that um, would be helpful in here. Notice I wrote clipboards with writing tools. And that's because when, if you really want the children to write, make pictures, and then add it to the block area, you're going to have to give them something hard to write on. Um, you can keep the tool, you know, tie a ribbon around it and keep it attached to the clipboard area so the writing tools don't end up in pockets. Um, but these are all really good ideas to help a child either connect print to the block area or write in the block area. <coughs> Excuse me. I need a drink of water, just a second. <coughs> As with all centers, there's always, you know, a couple of issues. So what would be the issues in a block area? A block area needs a big space. Often, um, centers will put the block area <clears throat> in the same space as the large group area. Therefore, it would get at least two uses. It's also a very noisy center. So you just got to realize that and be okay with that. <clears throat> and storage is very important in the block area because otherwise those blocks are going to get all over the classroom. And then um, one of the things that I don't want us to forget <clears throat> is make sure those items in the block area reflect the children in the classroom. So don't put pictures of gorgeous houses if the children in your classroom mostly live in apartments. Put in pictures of apartments then. So make sure that what is there reflect something that they are already, they already have an experience with. That will help the learning. So I wanted us to stop there because I, I threw a lot at you with the block area. And if you have any questions that are um, tied to the block area, this would be a good time to type those in and I'll have Cassie, let me know if, um, if any questions come up. So if you have a, a specific question, don't hesitate to write it in. <clears throat> I'll give you like a minute or two. Well, I don't see any, so I'm going to go on. But don't hesitate. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in. Yeah, there is a question. So we have one question. 
do you have any management techniques for kids who always want to go to the construction or block center? Oh, I love it. Yes, the the I'm going to be a little bit sexist here. It's the little boy that you can never get out of the block area. Uh, the best way that I have known to do that is um, to make a rule, um, and you might do it twice a week, that every child has to do a certain center and make sure it's one that they have not done. Um, otherwise, you may be very creative in how you teach that child every theme that you ever wanted to, him to learn from in blocks. Um, so, you know, you can uh, make it a rule that every day the teacher picks an area that the child um, gets to play in during the um, activity time. They don't have to stay there, but they have to at least stay there for X amount of minute. You can use timers for that, that kind of thing. That's a great question. And that happens a lot. Okay, let's go on to library listening. So what do students learn in the library listening area? Well, most, the best thing is, is they think and they'll act like a reader. Um, they usually increase their vocabulary because they're reading in complete sentences when somebody's reading to them. Um, or they're practicing the words of the picture. Um, it is small motor development when they're turning pages and manipulating a small book. They develop listening skills, and it's awesome when they love to go in the library area and, and hear stories just because they love stories. They connect that the print has a meaning, which of course is a precursor to reading, and um, they also begin to see books as a way to get information. All of that is really important. So when you're thinking about books and you know, like how many books do you need in a classroom? Well, uh, a general guideline is that you should have double the books that you have of the kids in the room. So if you have 20 kids in your room, there should be 40 books in the room. Um, it doesn't mean they all need to be in the library area because we're, you're going to find out that we're putting books in every center that match things. And what kind of books? Oh, man, you definitely want books that align with whatever you're learning about. That would be very, very important. But other than that, you want picture books, books that have no words, predictable books. There's a lot of different kinds of books. Rhyming books, fantasy, poetry, um, books that show diversity, books that show children with varying um, abilities, uh, books about feelings, books about science. So the, the list is really endless. Other items that you could have in a library listening area, of course, would be the listening uh, center. And by that, I mean some kind of a CD player, usually, or a DVD player that has headphones, and the children turn the pages with the books. Puppets are great in this area, and so are flannel boards. So after you have done the flannel story at large group time, you can then move it into the library listening area. And how cool to see the children tell each other the same story. The funding, again, is difficult. Um, I remember when I was teaching, most of the books that I um, had in my classroom, I bought at a garage sale, I'll just be honest. Or you go to the library when they're having their sales. Um, and, uh, Often um, parents or other teachers or adults, you know, that you know from church or from a community event that you know have older children, well, what have they done with their books? Um, 
because you do want a lot of them. Um, varying degrees of difficulty, I think you should think about in terms of the books. That's why it's good to put a book that doesn't have any words in it or um, a book that is like a board book that is very easy to manipulate with fing little fingers and then a book that has more pages, that kind of thing. And then alignment with the theme, that one is pretty easy because you definitely want at least some of the books in the area to be very aligned with the theme that you're going over. Just like with the block, oh, um, I forgot this slide. Um, I really, really, really think the print and writing go together. So it is very good to have your reading areas or your library areas very close to the writing area. So you see here three pictures. Um, the one on the left is a couple of kids re looking in a, in a reading center. And you'll notice, look at how comfortable that is. Think about when you're sitting with a cup of coffee and you're looking at a magazine. You don't want to sit on a hardwood chair. You're probably curled up in your couch. You might have a blanket. So think about that when you're designing where the kids are looking at the books. The um, picture in the middle shows a, a, a very a manufactured writing area. It doesn't need to look like that, but you can see that there's lots of things there that would entice them. We're going to go over a writing area in the future, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But the two skills are connected, and if the centers are near each other, it helps with that connection. And then you can see on the other picture, the children using a listening area. So there are some issues with the library area. It, it really needs to be separated. You don't want the library area next to the block area. It, it's too noisy. The kids in the library area tend to be, they want to be by themselves and they want a little bit of quiet. Um, there is the issue also of teachers using this center for a transition. So let's say um, you're coming in from the playground. Everybody's kind of sweaty. You walk in and the teacher says, everybody go get a book from the library area and bring it to the uh, large group area and, and you give them two or three minutes to look at a book. That's not a bad transition. That actually is a really good transition and it kind of calms them all down. But if you do that a lot, what you will find is that the children will not use the library area very well. So instead of using the library area, you might want to have another set of books near the large group time to do that. Um, so you just might need to think that through. And the materials have to be rotated, especially in this area. Otherwise, the kids will not go there. They'll be bored because it's the same exact book they've seen. Um, and also make sure, of course, that the items are reflective of the children in the classroom. So make sure there is good representation of um, boys and girls. Um, good representation of all different kinds of races and cultures. Um, uh, so um, that's all that's all very, very important. And you can pretty much easily do that nowadays in books. It used to not be that easy to do, but nowadays they've got really good books for most of that. Okay, we'll have a, a minute or two for questions on the library area.
When we get done today, I'm going to let the recording go a little, like maybe five minutes. So if you've got questions at the end, you could do that too. We have one question. Would you put any type of leveled readers for students already reading? Oh, yes. If you if you have a child already reading, yeah. Um, if not, I don't know that it's not um, a good idea to do that perhaps near the end of the school year. Like, let's say um, you have one child reading. Um, and they like those books. You might want to introduce that at large group time or at small group instruction to show the kids that, whoa, when you're big and you go to kindergarten, then you're going to see these kinds of books. These are special books and kind of go through that. Um, so it, it kind of depends. Most four year olds do not read. Um, and they, they're learning all the skills so that as soon as that is introduced to them, they'll get it fast. Um, but most four-year-olds do not read. But that if you have someone that's reading, I had one time a, a little girl that was reading very well, and I actually had her read the story. She would take home one book during the weekend um, she would practice reading it with her mom and dad, and then when she came to school on Monday, she read the book to the class. Um, but that was like one child. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah. One more question. For listening, are the use of iPads acceptable, or should we have a technology center separate? That's a very good question. We are not going to go over a technology um, center, but I do think that that is a good place. If you were going to use um, technology, this would be the place to do it. Yes, because it again, it is a, a quiet, usually, um, especially if you're using headphones, quiet individual activity not a social activity, even though sometimes in the library area, you know, the kids are all reading one book, you know, it just kind of depends. But yes, another time of the day that technology is used, I think very effectively is during small group time. So you might think of in your small group time, um, you would have say four to six kids, maybe even as many as eight, at one center with you and that would be when you would do technology boy you guys got good questions <laughs> all righty we're gonna go on to math so what do children learn in the math area um, one of the biggest things in math is the increase in vocabulary especially if the math concept has been introduced at another time during the day. Um, then you can keep adding that word in when you see that children are in the math center. And there's loads of skills that kids can play, counting, measuring, sequencing, matching, estimating, patterning. I mean, there's a million things. Um, it does help them begin their logic skills they get to practice using different math tools like a balance scale or a ruler. And it just increases their experience with numbers and shapes. So ideas for the math center is there are zillions of open-ended materials like tape measures, balance scales, rulers, um, little objects to be sorted or counted, number lines, parquetry uh, law. I mean, there's, you can tell, geo boards, stamps, stamp pads, blocks, dominoes. When you start thinking about it and thinking and then rotating these kinds of things, the children will go to the math, cent math center because they haven't seen all these things. And um, it's fun to play with them. Um, items to facilitate sorting. 
So simple things like egg cartons, ice cube trays, muffin tins, that kind of thing that you can get in the dollar store. Um, and then games like bingo or matching, that kind of thing. Funding I um, is, you know, obviously, you know, we've gone over funding. I think the block area and the dramatic play area are probably the two most expensive areas in the room. But maths, if you want a really nice balance scale, it's going to cost you some money. Um, but a lot of this can be made or a parent can help you make it. Um, because parents are always wanting to help if they can get the construction paper and the um, contact paper and the scissors from you and you can tell them what you need. Um, they're able to make really good games for you that will, um, uh, that will be fun and the children will enjoy learning. Obviously, it's very easy to make the mass center have varying degrees of difficulty. Just the nature of the mass center does that. And alignment with um, the theme or unit sometimes can be tricky, but most of the time it can be pretty easy. Like, let's say you're doing autumn. You should maybe be doing autumn about now. You might put some pumpkins or apples in the math area with a tape measure. So the children are um, measuring, writing down the number of, and which number matches which apple or which pumpkin, um, which one weighs the most. Um, uh, you might make a, a, a game that has the numbers uh, five to 10 on it, and you're using small uh, sticker, you know, you put Apple stickers on a, um, a piece of cardboard or card stock, and they put five apples by the number five, or uh, the ideas are endless. But I, I'm going through this to show you really any, almost any theme or unit you can alter the materials that are in the math center to help the children, children's brains make the connection. Because that, remember that video, that's what we're aiming for, is more connections. So what about print and writing? Well, again, I would use clipboards with paper. You might put some newspaper ads that have numbers in them. So if they're learning numbers, maybe they just cut out all the number ones that they can see in a bunch of ads. Wipe off boards, little chalk boards, um, books that um, are focused on counting or patterns or shapes um, can all put print or writing in the math area. There are a couple of issues with the math area. Um, Usually it needs a little more teacher interaction. And by that, I would um, uh, recommend that the teacher, before the children go to all the activities, has described what is in the math area, described the connection to the theme, and kind of explained it. Um, that way you'll make sure that the items in the math area are being used the way they're supposed to be used. There is also an issue because there's a lot of little things in the math area. So you've got to be careful of that, especially if you have three-year-olds. You don't want to put a bunch of like seeds in there at the beginning of the year because they'll end up in somebody's nose. <laughs> I'll just tell you, or they'll be eaten. Um, so you want to think through the age of the child and the small things that either you're using to count or sort, and is that a good match? Um, because obviously we don't want them in their mouth um, or in other parts of their body. <laughs> um, and I think I already said the best practice is to introduce the math skill at either large or small group time. 
And again, make sure the items are reflective of the children in the classroom. If your school is right next to apple orchards and those apple orchards only grow um, Granny Smith apples, then you should have Granny Smith apples in the math area to measure. So all of that helps the child to connect, um, make more connections in the brain. You might even think of languages in, uh, for this reflection also. Are the numbers that are written on the games, are they in English and in Spanish? Um, so you might think of it that way too. Okay, how about some questions on the math area? Okay. Here's one. Okay. Do you think there needs to be product that the kids have to show when working in the math center? Oh, a product. A product. No. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a good um, example of that in another couple of slides. Um, so it could, but it doesn't have to. Because remember, children need repeated use. So it helps their brain to connect numbers when one month they're connecting, um, they're doing apples, and the next month they're doing mittens. They're counting, they're patterning, they're, they're doing the same math skill, but they're doing it with different objects. And um, there should be eventually by the end of the year some written representation of what they can do in math but that doesn't need to be on a daily basis at all as a matter of fact i would say the most important thing is just to have them practice the skill we have one more mm -hmm. do you recommend this center to be more small group or independent i have teachers that want to only do small group yeah, and you know what? Uh, we are going to go over nine centers. And I think at right when we started, I recommended, or there is a best practice recommendation of having seven centers in the room. So if a school decided, you know what, we're not going to do math as a center, we're going to do it as a small group activity, I think that's fine. As long as you see all, all that materials that we just listed? Those small group times should go through all those materials. Otherwise, if the child doesn't have direct experience with all of those, measuring, balancing, patterning, sequencing, then they are not gonna learn the skill. And when it's only done at small group, they don't usually get the practice they need. So that would be the other piece of it that, um, and I think kids need practice with the math. So, um, but it is, it, a lot of schools do that and, and there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, we're gonna practice now. So we've, I've thrown a lot at you today. So I'm gonna show you a picture. And this first picture is of a block center. And I'd like you just to write in what you think is good about the block center. And what do you think, how could we improve the block center? So here's the picture. So type away, what's good about it? And what, okay, variety of materials I see. Yeah, look how much stuff is in there. There is no way a kid would not go in that area. It looks way too fun. I want to play in it. There's lots of space. 
Yeah, you can tell they're socializing. The little girl in blue looks like she's asking the little girl with the number 10 on her t-shirt, looks like she's asking her a question. The children are very engaged. And look how creative they've been. They've used different materials. Um, that's all really, really, really good. Okay, let's think of some, yeah, there's a variety of the sizes of blocks and look what they did with them. Um, okay, so what, how could this area be improved? So think about what we've gone over and, and how could you improve that area? Labels, yeah, good, good, Sue. Yeah, I don't see any labels. So uh, this would kind of be a teacher's nightmare for the kids to put away. They, they, you can't tell where the pieces go. Um, and labeling in this area could be very easily done. Um, yeah, there is no labeling. Anything else that you find missing? I'm thinking of at least a couple of things. Yeah, there's no books, there's no literacy connection, good. There's no, it doesn't look like there's anything to write with. There's no books in there. Um, so that would be a way to improve this center. Can you tell what the children are learning about by looking at this picture? What is the theme that the teacher is doing all day long? Can you tell by what the children are doing? You really can't, can you? I mean, there's, it looks like there's dinosaurs, there's some vehicles, uh, you can't tell. And yeah, the theme is not evident. And that sometimes is the way to go about looking at the each center is to say, can I tell what the theme or unit is based on what is in the, what is in that area? Sometimes I, I think, Raquel, you're saying, um, I'm trying to read your, add pictures of what you want. Yeah, what you want the children to build. That would then add to the theme. You'd be able to tell what the theme is. But in, in this area, you can't tell that it's tied at all to the theme, which um, remember the video. What we want all day long is whatever the overarching theme is, we want everything the child does that day to be tied to that theme in some way, to make better connections. So, um, you know, this is a beautiful block area, but there's a couple of ways it could be Im improved without a lot, 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 lot of work. Okay, I have one more that I want you to do the exact same thing. Tell me what you like about this center and how could this one be improved? And this is a math one. So when we were talking earlier about math, this is what I wanted you to see. Doesn't she look proud? I love this picture. So what's good and, and how could it be improved? Real objects for sorting. Don't you love it? And look how many different things there are. There is some labeling. So, you know, you can a, a little bit like there is I see a label on one of those blue um, tubs over there, but the labeling is still, at least each of the things have somewhere to be put. Um, so that, um, again, right, and there is no literacy. Again, can you tell what the overarching theme is for the day? 
Yeah, you, you really can't. It could be a million different things. Sometimes when I look at this, I go, I mean, this looks very fun. Preschool kids, pre-kindergarten kids would love this area. But in some ways, I think there may be too much there. So if it was, if you were going over autumn and the thing they were sorting were leaves or nuts, that would probably be enough. It wouldn't have to have all of these things. Um, it's not wrong to have all this variety, but I think it would be better if every one of those items were theme related. Um, okay, well, great. Thank you for um, helping me with that. Okay, well, we're gonna try to wrap up now. We got a, just a couple more minutes, so Yes, I have an assignment for you. Um, so here it is. What I would like you to do over the next couple of weeks is to pick one center. So either blocks or library or math. Don't do all three unless you're just a, you know, type A personality like I am, but pick one. I'm going to show you an inventory sheet that isn't very long, and I want you to assess all of the that learning center. So if you've got four classrooms and you pick blocks, you're going to either have the teacher assess that or you are, whichever. And then I want you to try to decide on what improvement could you make. Does it need more materials? Does it need labeling? Should you add some print or some writing? How could you improve that one area? And you might not be able to get all that done in a couple of weeks. I realize there's other things in life going on, but you could at least plan for the improvement. So what improvements are you planning to make? Here is the, listen, the learning center assessment it is one of the handouts so one of the handouts has this on a bigger p obviously on a piece of paper and it it's pretty simple there are enough materials in this center for the number of kids the materials in the centers have varying degrees of difficulty the materials are ro rotated to maintain interest the materials are relevant to the theme unit or project they reflect the children um, there's labeling, there's evidence of print, and there are opportunities for the child to write. And then you might, at the end, think of what did we do really, really good in and what thing could we improve upon and then try to make that improvement. And again, I realize that depending on what else is going on at the center, this might take you a little more time, but that is definitely what we want to do. So our next steps, obviously today was the webinar. You're going to try to work on your assignment. Our POC is in a couple of weeks. It's the day before Halloween at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I will have you share what improvement, what did you learn from doing the assessment? Um, what center did you choose um, and what did you learn about that center and how would you improve it? And then after the PL, we'll talk about that at the PLC. And then after that, I'll individually call each of you and we can talk about this in a little more detail. Um, and just quickly, these were the same resources I had last time, but I actually put page numbers. So if you actually get these books, you'll know exactly where I got most of the stuff that um, we talked about today. Um, again, don't forget to go to our SharePoint site. Um, and again, my phone number and email address are there for you. And uh, this list, all of the items, we had a long webinar today. So the next one will be a little bit shorter. Even though we are doing three centers, I won't have to go over the why. Um, but I felt like that was an important thing for us to begin with. 
So um, any last minute questions, I'm going to take off the recording um, and then I'll either answer them in an email to you just because of time. Um, I'll do that. I'll just answer them in an email to you. I wanted to get to this. This is one of my favorite quotes from an awesome lady. If you've never gone to a workshop by Bev Boss, you have to. It says, if it hasn't been in the hand and the body, it can't be in the brain. I think that says it all. So you all have a great rest of the day and thank you for your participation. Again, I'm going to turn my mic off, but you can keep writing questions um, or write them down and we'll talk about them. Um, or if you want to know the answer quickly, write them down and I'll get to them today. Thank you or tomorrow.